Okay, so let, let's get started. Uh, today's program uh, is just, just following our syllabus, and this is going to be showing surgeries. And so, so far, this is, a lot of this has been anecdotal, <clears throat> and it's been um, the records and the rules and the do's and the don'ts and so forth, and really, uh, uh, what is it, when the tire hits the pavement, that's, that's the surgery part. So we're going to go through uh, three or maybe four, we'll see what the time, time allows, uh, three or four different types of surgery with Chrome. And um, we'll get started here with it. Uh, I always like to read this first statement here because I, I think that, you know, watching some videos and kind of cursory looking at Chrome may not always see the full scope of what Chrome offers. And so um, Chrome is a pre-planned surgery that starts with the smile simulation and ends with a predictable method of delivering the final restoration. Chrome delivers bone reduction guidance, osteotomy guidance, implant control, abutment insertion control, a simplified prosthetic conversion on the day of surgery, and then a very simplified method of converting to the final restoration. And um, I think James and I, at the end, will have a little chat about this, about the chair side, and about the um, about what how he offers chair side support, because if if Chrome goes very smoothly, the last part of that sentence is what makes Chrome sometimes the biggest benefit, and that's the simplified procedure of going to the final restoration. That that is um, heads over um conventional full arch procedures all on four conversions other systems out there that are freehand not guided and even other guided systems they don't have that restorative protocol uh, that that makes uh, chrome worth implementing okay <clears throat> photographs uh left and right profile those are optional uh, we like them if a patient is in class two class one uh, <clears throat> uh, just just you know, class two, class three, I'm sorry, just so we can see if we need to work on the, the tooth position profile. Um, photographs, uh, full full uh, uh, retraction with teeth in occlusion, left, right, and center. And then I won't spend much time at all, digital impressions, upper, lower bite, and hopefully the bite is stable um, so that we don't have to do a little back and forth with, the, with getting the bite right and a comb beam. Those are the records. We bring the smile and we superimpose it over the teeth, do a setup, make a denture, and then we go through the whole process doing an online meeting. Uh, we kind of been through that, so I don't want to go through it. Uh, and then the package is sent to, um, to surgery. A couple other PowerPoints that, that I'm going to show tonight that show a little bit of between uh, the, the records and what you read uh, for the surgery that's really important. But Chrome is repeat. So every case has a pin guide that's what you see here on the right and in fact i'll get the upper and lower going at the same time the pin guide let me just forgive me let me go back up here the pin guide is always step one the pin guide is tried in uh and, and you you seat it on the teeth you make sure there's no rock there's always windows on a dentate case so that you can see the teeth emerging through the pin guide now in this case you can see that the pin guide already has metal which means that the pin guide was tried in once, it fit, the, the labial flap, labial tissue was reflected, then the pin guide is reinserted uh, with, um, you know, on, on the metal. And then it's, <clears throat> then while it's held in place, the doctor does the labial fixation screws, uh, drill, drills the sites, puts pins in, and then once the fixation base, the metal, is secured against the bone on the reflected ridge, reflected buckle bone, then the pin guide is removed. Once the pin guide is removed, then the teeth are extracted and the bone is reduced down to the level of the fixation base. So again, it's, it's repeat. This happens on every single dentate case. Uh, you, if, if there are variations, it's only because a doctor has a technique on bone reduction, tooth extraction, perhaps you're doing socket preservation, uh, you know, um, socket shield. I mean, there's other kinds of things that go on in surgery, but as far as chrome implementation, pin guide delivers the fixation base, the bone is reduced down to the level of fixation base, then the carrier guide goes in. That's the, uh, the apparatus there on the left. And the apparatus on the left, that is put in 
right, and I'm sorry, on the right, it's kind of hard to see because it's, uh, it's a clear translucent um, guide. They are both seated once you think that the bone has been reduced. And when you reduce bone, uh, as you reduce it, once you think you're 100%, take your finger in a glove and go transition your finger from the metal over the bone. And you can feel a smooth transition. You can see it visually. We don't have a lingual bow like some other companies do, uh, plastic guides. We don't put a lingual bow, just a facial fixation base. And uh, because we don't need the lingual, the lingual really is only there for stability, not necessarily for bone reduction. Uh, so we only have it on the facial. So you'll rub your finger, make sure the bone's reduced, and then you can seat the carrier guide. If the carrier guide seats passively, then you know you've reduced enough bone. If it doesn't seat passively, then you know that there's either tissue or there's bone in the way. So first address the tissue, make sure it's reflected out of the way. Tie a, you tie a stitch, you can see there's a suture there uh, on the upper and there's one on the lower to hold it out of the way. If it's not passive, then uh, adjust the bone down until the carrier guide is seated smoothly. Okay, then the carrier guide comes out and the next step is to uh, place the osteotomy guide. Uh, and and if, if you've seen uh, recent images of chrome, you'll notice that the chrome is, is, is shinier and you'll see it's designed a little bit different. These pictures are from mid last summer, last spring. So the osteotomy guide goes in, you go through your drilling sequence. In this case, uh, all of the sites, except maybe on the far left back as a hex, all the rest of them are circles. Forgive me, this one is also a hex. And at that time, a hex meant that an implant was angled because that way you could have the hex timing. Today, they're all round and we just put a little nub on the osteotomy guide to indicate where to stop rotating the implant when you're placing it. Uh, so at this stage, in this image here, you'll go through the whole sequence of drilling your osteotomies. Let me mention, and I, and I don't, don't mean to be insulting at all when I say this, uh, please know your guided kit. You know, Chrome has to use a guided kit. It can't be, um, it can't be just managing the drills with, uh, with our osteotomy guide. It has to manage a tool or a hub or something in a guided kit, preferably a fully guided kit, so that way when you're placing the implant, it is also controlled. And the reason for this is you want depth control to be perfect, especially on angled, and you want <clears throat> rotation to be controlled 100% uh, so that the trajectory of your temporary cylinders is straight up and down. That's really key to, um, <clears throat> to performing chrome in a, in a timely manner. Because if the implants are not in the right rotation, then you end up... Uh, uh, removing temporary cylinders and abutments later. We'll talk about that. So on the left-hand side, and now the right-hand side, the left-hand side, that's the, that's the mount on a Megagen case, a Megagen guided kit, those little green um, uh, concavities. Those are, uh, those are indicators of where to stop rotating the implant based on a hex or today based on the nub. When a green um, concavity lines up with, <clears throat> with the nub, you stop rotating if you're at the right depth. And then your indexing is correct uh, for placing an implant. And on the right, you saw an implant going in, being delivered. Let me just, let me back that up one slide. And then come back down. So on the right-hand side, you'll see that the hand piece is delivering the implant. Now this doctor torques out with the handpiece. Uh, a lot of doctors torque out by hand with a hand driver, but the key here is that the implant is managed by the carrier, as opposed to just the drills being managed by the carrier. Some kits only control the drill. Our advice is you purchase a kit that controls the implant as well. Do you go out and change implants, implant companies for that reason? It, that, I'll leave that up to you, but if you're selecting an implant in a guided system, pick fully guided, which means ask the rep if the implant is controlled by the, uh, by the driver, and if, because that way, it, um, that way it's controlled by the guide. And that's not just for Chrome. That's for any guided system out there. You get one guide, a master tube, and everything is controlled within that tube. Really important for guided surgery. So the next step uh, the, the implants are in, then place the multi-unit abutments, 
and then place the temporary cylinders. You can see them there in the, in the center and on the bottom right, temporary cylinders. Hopefully, they are all pointing almost in the same direction, which is up, so that you have a draw, a path of insertion on the prosthetic, so that when you place the prosthetic in the middle image there, you can easily just seat it and then backfill around each cylinder to pick up the cylinder. And what, what happens frequently is that uh, there are angled sites and the implant is rotated five, six, seven degrees off, which is halfway between a, a turn, a bevel, and the temporary cylinder is sitting at a 15, 20 degree angle, and the prosthetic doesn't seat. And the right thing to do is to rotate that implant back or to turn it one more, uh, maybe you know five, six, seven degrees uh, more, <clears throat> and that way you can put the abutment in the next in the next indexing. Because if you have to grind and adjust the prosthetic, it's time consuming, it'll be a little frustrating, and of course, those screw holes, uh, they're kind of permanent, you know, unless you're going from maybe a 30 to a 17, or somehow back to a zero, or any combination thereof to correct that screw access hole, that screw access hole is always going to be in that position. So if it comes out facially or lingually, you're kind of kind of stuck with it, and so it's better to know the kit, and then do a little adjustment in surgery to write that implant, write the abutment. Uh, please ask questions about that at the end. I'd love to have a more conversation about that. So this, um, this we, we just showed the, the one arch, uh, but this was a double arch, and you can just see the, you know, the, the position of the implants is just perfect. It's funny, we have, we have many, many, many full arch cases in this laboratory, and you can instant, almost instantly pull up a case in your hand, look at the models, and you'll know if it's guided or not. You'll know if it's Chrome or not, or some other guided system based on what you see here on these bottom images. And I, again, I don't, I don't mean that offensively at all to doctors at all. We see a lot of cases freehanded that look that are just great. So I don't mean it like that. Uh, but, but by far the, the most common, if it's not guided, the implants are stepped up and down the bone reduction was not leveled, and the implants are in, um, so, some, some of the implants can be in compromised positions for the restorative. So this is what Chrome delivers, you know, a beautiful upper and lower prosthetics on implants that are planned and in the ideal position. And that's Leonard, and Leonard allowed us to put his face on the, on the screen. So that's, that's Leonard six months later, happy guy. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let me go to the next one. I'm gonna I'm gonna save double edentulous for the very last because uh, that's really gonna be the least common type of patient. Uh, I just happened to have another case by Dr. Towell. He he uh, documents and shares, which we love. Uh, maxillary dentate with PET socket shield. Now I'm I'm I think James told me that uh, socket shield or um, partial extraction therapy, there's different names for it, is becoming quite popular in Europe, and it is here too, especially for these full arch cases where you can um, you can control the, the the buccal plate and hopefully long term bone. We'll see what the studies are on that, um, but long term bone, especially when you're delivering an FP1 uh, prosthetic. So this is, um, this is what you receive. This, it's, it, this is, I, I cropped it out just so that we could have the important parts of it. But what you'll receive after the online meeting with, uh, uh, with um, the Chrome team is you'll get an email. And the email will have the implants that you planned. So these are all the implant sites. These are the diameters of the implants. And these are the length of the implants. And then these are the degrees. So this case should be relatively smooth, um, pr pretty, pretty simple to restore, all zeros. We'll see how that goes. And, um, but here's the key. The day after you plan it, day or two after you plan it, should be the day of, you're going to get this email. You can order your implant parts based on width and length. You can order your angled or straight MUAs. And then we always recommend ordering a collar height that is uh, two, um, between two and three millimeters high. You don't want it too much higher because then they stick above the carrier guide and you don't want them too low because they sink down in the tissue. One thing to be to, to note that is if you're using, um, for instance, Nobel, Nobel 30 degree abutments, their shortest collar height is 3.5. That's kind of tall. It's okay, but it's kind of tall. If you're going to do 3.5, you may want to order a lower collar height 
if you have straights in the anterior so that you're not stepping with a prosthetic over those multi-unit abutments because closer to the tissue is better. Uh, for instance, neodent, their lowest 30 degree MUA is only 1.5 millimeters and that is significant between Nobel. So again, if you're, if you're selecting companies, that, that's an important thing to know um, on, their, on their components. So upper and lower. Let me mention one more thing I think that's critical for these types of surgeries is the idea of rescue implants. So you're gonna order a lot of 4.0s and you're gonna order one 4.5. But what happens when you're in the maxilla and you reach soft bone and you only have ordered six 4.0 implants? If you know that you have the bone width, suggestion is you buy rescue implants. You don't have to take them out of the box. Keep them on hand in case one of these 4.0s, two or three, or all these 4.0s have to come out and then put a tighter implant in so that you can deliver a prosthetic. So rescue implants, consider that. This is, uh, this is called Surgy Mat. This comes with all these cases um, now. And this does not correspond with the case I just showed you, but Surgy Mat replaces the old reports that we used to send. This report on the left, I guess I could call it Surgy Wall, we called it Surgy Mat, but on the left, um, you would uh, um, unroll this and you would tape this to the wall or onto a computer monitor. Actually, we can email you a JPEG if you want on the computer monitor. But this gives you all the references uh, for, of the surgery. It gives you a pan. It gives you a cross section to show how the fixation base uh, fits against the bone. It shows how the osteotomy guide is going to seat. Um, this will also have the pins, which ones are long and short. doesn't have it on this one. And then all the cross sections of the implants. That's one part of it. The other part is what's actually is the surgery mat, and this is for helping with organize the day of surgery components. So this form you see here is big. It's 47 inches long uh, by 12 inches tall, and we cut it. And this part here will go on your counter or on your surgical table if you have room, and you can physically take your implants, your multi-unit abutments, and your two sets of temporary cylinders. Always order two sets right? One for the prosthetic pickup and then one for the rapid appliance. You can lay them all out and this will tell you that there's a 30 degree, zero, 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 30 degree and your parts are all in the right place. Uh, I, I go to surgeries quite often. I notice that often the doctors are taking like a blue or a, you know, a surgical cloth with a Sharpie and just writing a number and a circle and dropping a part there. This is really nice for laying out the parts and knowing what to grab at the right time. So on this case, you get an upper and then a uh, this is a double arch. I think it's a double arch case. So you get two surgery mats, one for the upper, one for the lower. So let's go through. Uh, here we go. Let's go through this case. This is, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a maxillary surgery. I believe he did. I believe this is a double arch, but it's a maxillary with partial extraction therapy. So he sends us the photographs. This Right, so a retracted picture in occlusion, and then left, right, and center. And we're gonna again skip over some of the um, some of the records part of it, but we do an online meeting, uh, host a live meeting, and uh, uh, come to come to terms, agree on where all the implants should be, where the abutment should emerge through the prosthetic, uh, go through each implant sagittally to ensure that it's uh, you know to your satisfaction of location. Fast forward a little bit, right? So go through every single implant and then go to surgery. So this is, again, it's the same protocol. So the pin guide was tried in. You made sure that it fits. You can use the little windows. You definitely want to use the windows to make sure you can see the tooth contacting the, the pin guide. And then once you know it fits and uh, fully seats, then you remove it. And then you lay uh, the labial flap all the way down beyond the bone, uh, well, the bone reduction line, but even further than that, you reflect the tissue past the fixation base because the fixation base is gonna be set, in this case, maxilla, uh, um, above the bone reduction line and the tissue has to be above it. So it's a full flap reflection on the facial. On the lingual, it's a much less aggressive uh, flap. In fact, that's one of the things you'll find with um, plastic guides is you have, you have to have an aggressive lingual flap, sometimes even just making a, 
an incision down the palate and uh, just peeling back that, that flap. It's actually very aggressive and a lot more healing time. Okay, so pin guide goes in, uh, drill the, um, the, the facial sites. They're, they're transcortical. We design them so that the pin engages uh, the lingual cortex, uh, the drill and the pin. And the goal is to be able to put the pin in, push it in, and then do a little bit of a tap with a surgical mallet at the very end. If you find, let me, let me just slow, let me just put pause here. If you find that, uh, that the first drill and pin just drop in with finger pressure, then on the next site, this is when laying the labial fixation, on the next site, take the drill and only, only drill it halfway and then place the pin with your finger and then uh, use a surgical mallet and tap it all the way to the cortical blade. And it's not the most comfortable thing for the patient. Uh, generally patients are um, intubated and out. Uh, but even, even if a patient is in just kind of twilight and still, you know, still half awake, uh, you still have to make sure that the fixation base is solid against, uh, solidly fixed in the bone. And if you, there's a chance that if you just push in all three or four pins, that that fixation base will move as you're going through the surgery based on pressure from placing implants. Uh, sometimes doctors accidentally use the fixation base as a lever to extract um, teeth, and then you will uh, make that fixation base loose in the maxilla. So halfway through and then, and then tap in. And then once all the pins are in, um, undo the chrome locks, remove the carrier, uh, the pin guide, and then, uh, forgive me, and then proceed with uh, tooth adjustment, tooth extraction. You know, in this case, this patient had uh, you know, large metal PFM uh, bridge work. So that was removed. And the plan on this case was to leave uh, most of the teeth at the gum line, at the root, and not do extractions, but just do um, basically, uh, basically surgery and cut the teeth right down to the, to the next, right down to the, to the ridge, and then perform a PET, which is partial extraction therapy. I don't want to go through all the details of that, and I think the, the doctor opted for which teeth he was going to do partial extraction therapy. I think often it's just on the centrals or maybe the front six. Watch a little bit of this here. So he's still adjusting bone down to the level of the fixation base, and then even adjusting the, um, the PET roots. So again, just adjust everything down until you can feel with your finger that it's smooth, and then you would try in the carrier guide to make sure that it's passive. Let me fast forward a little bit. Some adjusting takes more than others. So we've been in, court, uh, in cases where, um, where tooth adjustment is, uh, reduction is an hour, two hours. Um, my, my, our opinion is that's probably too long. Uh, sometimes uh, it's just a, maybe being a little bit too delicate with teeth, tooth extractions when the bone reduction is even above the roots. I mean, the teeth should just come out, use a very aggressive burr, uh, James sells a burr called Mr. Hungry Burr. It's, it's a nickname for it. It's a comet burr, but it's very aggressive, and you will quickly go through the bone reduction. And if you need to, use rangiers, use a piezo. We have doctors here in the States who use a surgical saw. Uh, and the, so for t 10 minutes for one doctor is an hour and a half for another, believe it or not. Same exact case based on what tool and the experience and the aggressiveness of it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a race. Uh, but still, the, the, the quicker, the better, I think, for all kinds of reasons. So this doctor performed the socket shield. You can see the roots are still here. Just the facial of the roots to maintain that bone, the bone levels. And now this was, again, this was a Megagen guided kit. Uh, you can see the hexes. So this is angled, 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 angled. All, every one of these implants is on an angle. And part of the reason is because on socket shield, uh, you place an implant just a little bit more palatally and you tip the, uh, the apex of the implant um, you know, away from the, the tip of the root of that tooth just so you can make sure you're in bone. I think there's other biological reasons too. Uh, 
uh, but all angled implants. Megagen and a few others could give you the list at the end if you like. They have a very interesting um, uh, product where the hub of the driver is the, the outside diameter of the, of the hub of the driver is the inside diameter of chrome. You'll notice with a lot of guided kits, there's a spoon, right? So the spoon goes into our osteotomy, then the drill goes inside the spoon. And that works very well, except you do add uh, you know, a level of um, variance because the tool has a little twist to it, and then the drill also has a little twist to it, a little variance to it, and so that'll affect the apex of the implant. Sites are drilled. We'll kind of go get a little fast forward here. It's already, um, we're already 30 minutes into the program. So then the implants are also controlled with the, with the driver, which is the, really the, the ideal way to place implants when guided surgery. Implants are in. This doctor uses this ISQ measurements to make sure that he has the right uh, torque and the right uh, resistance on the implants to load them. So not a very good picture here, but the multi-unit abutments are then placed. They're placed through the carrier guide. And let me, let me just go back here to show this important part. All right, not a good picture, apologies, but it's a very critical part of these surgeries. The carrier guide has notches if the implant is angled. So you can see all of these are angled because they have this notch with a little black halo around it. And what this will tell you is that the hole on the multi-unit abutment, the hole for the abutment screw is gonna line up with this notch. That means the implant is in the right rotation. So there's a hole, notch, hole, notch, et cetera, all the way around. You can even see here, there's a little hole there and there's a notch. If the implant is in the right rotation, the hole will, will emerge here. That means this multi-unit abutment is going straight up in the right trajectory. And that way, when you add your temporary cylinder, the temporary cylinders are vertical. We, I've already talked about this a couple of times, but that is very, very important for efficiency with these cases, especially when you have multiple angled implants. So on this case, I think the doctor had to open up these holes a little bit here and here uh, because everyone was angled. But I think in, in the end, the implants, the, uh, the, the temporary cylinders are in a good position. He just had to make some, a little bit of adjustment to it. And there's a couple ways to go about this. And, and this could take, you know, could take a long time to, to, to chat about and go back and forth about. But in, in bottom line is, if the prosthetic does not seat because you have a little bit of divergency, make a couple of choices. One choice is that you remove the temporary cylinder, remove the abutment, torque the implant back four or five degrees until this is straight up here in the middle. Or you make the decision that this is acceptable. If it is acceptable, you may have to adjust a little bit of this pink, a little bit of the, um, the, the nano ceramic here. You can also seat some of these temporary cylinders that are passive, that are parallel, and then you may be able to drop a temporary cylinder down from the occlusal because of the trajectory and still screw it down or make a little bit of an adjustment here around the rim of the, of the um, prosthetic and drop it down from the occlusal. So that's a nice trick when you're in surgery where you, in, instead of just opening up holes, kind of randomly to, until it, it is passive, seat the ones that are passive first and then work uh, on the others. Alan? Yes. A tip there as well. And what we're teaching chair side with just that particular part is that you place one temporary abutment at a time, fit your prosthesis, and then check another one. It's yeah. much easier to detect if one of them is slightly off. Because if you put them all on and then try and get the path of insertion over the top and there's, you don't know which one to adjust. And so yeah. you end up cutting the life out of your prosthesis. Yeah, exactly. And so look at this occlusal image here. Those holes are bigger than what we designed. You know, the, the, the straight holes are six millimeters, angled holes are seven millimeters. Well, this is nine or 10. This is, this is eight. So he, the doctor is adjusted. And, and I think that's a good technique. Um, I do think that visually, when, you're, when the patient is sitting and you're looking straight down at the patient's face, and if they all especially if the abutment's all lined up, especially on straight implants, 
you can put all those temporary cylinders on and seat the prosthetic. Um, if you find that they start to go, that they're a little bit crooked as you're placing them, that's a good technique, just what we discussed there. So you can see on that last image, uh, the doctor um, had uh, adjusted the, the tops of the temporary cylinders. Often the prosthetics are thick enough that you don't have to adjust the metal cylinders, but sometimes on the cingulums of the interiors that you do. And I'm gonna go through just one more case here. Um, I know we've gone over the last few meetings, but I think it's okay. I think everybody can stay on if they'd like to, and we'd like them to. So uh, let's go through a... <clears throat> Give me here. I, actually, you know, since since we're not going to do many double edentulas, let's go through this other case that I think is um, very helpful for patients who have. Where are you? Oh, darn it. Come on. Here we go. This is Dr. Lee. This is a local doctor. And the reason I bring this one up, I, we, it's a maxillary dentate with what we call a bite proof. Because many of these cases that we see, uh, the, the arch that's going to be surgerized and the opposing arch have malocclusion, roly-poly occlusion. They have uh, a reverse smile. They have teeth that are super erupted, step up, step down, that kind of thing. And, and perhaps the case is planned for uh, one chrome arch now and one chrome arch later, the opposing arch later, maybe because of finances, because of surgery fear, whatever the reason is, uh, or even if the case is not going to be. The idea is that we can level out the plane of occlusion and give the patient an ideal plane of occlusion and do something else on the opposing, even if it's not chrome, make the chrome prosthetic ideal. That's what this case will do. Let me run you through this real quick. So again, this is... Uh, this is what you'll receive on the day of, order your parts. Um, I won't go through all any, any of the work up on this, but you'll order your parts, your abutments, your implants, everything uh, based on this report. We'll send you the surgery mat, and then we'll send you this product. This is a maxillary chrome case and a lower bite proof. And the, the, the cost on the lower is very inexpensive. James, uh, we and James have worked out a very nice fee for this. It's not customary, <laughs> customary full arch of temporaries because we're already in CAD. We're already um, digitized. We just simply make this lower and we mill it from a PMA and you bond it on the existing teeth during the day of surgery. So the, the vertical opening, the space, everything has already been taken into account because we're opening the bite anyway for this particular case and most cases. So this is essentially what we send, chrome and then, uh, then a full arch temp. So let, let's just go through, the, I'll go through this case real quickly because uh, we've already been through um, these types of surgeries. All right, so collapse bite, small teeth, and even in her, in her smile, you can see that, um, uh, that she is collapsed. So we opened the bite and made both, uh, both prosthetics. So pin guide, lay the flap, seat the pin guide, hold it in place firmly, Make sure that it's 100% seated on the teeth. There's no rock. Drill the facial sites. Remove the pin guide. Everything above the fixation base will be removed. All right. A little bit of a lingual flap with, uh, with, a, with a, a stitch. Stitches. Remove the prosthetic. Remove the, the crowns, the bridges. Reduce the bone down to the fixation base. This is a periodontist, and she uses a little burr. <laughs> we like to see a little more aggressive burrs, and I know bone reduction took quite a, quite a long time on this, um, but she just, just does excellent work. We love working with her. Actually, she's only about three miles from our laboratory. We get to go to all of her surgeries. It's just beautiful work. All right, reduce it. It's a BLX. This is a guided kit where it has peak inserts. They're moving away from this. It's a little 
little cumbersome um, inserting the spoons in and out of this kit. Uh, so let's we do a little fast forward here. So that's um, the guide, the implants are in, the carrier guide is in, the abutments are in, and then James, you can see these. Uh, I believe those two were angled, but when you put the handles in to deliver the abutments, you know that they're parallel because the handles are perfectly parallel. In this case, I would say add the uh, the anterior two temporary cylinders and you should be able to deliver it. Well, look what happened. We put the anterior two temporary cylinders on and they're not parallel. So in this case, you, you could pick up the posterior two and, and then address the two anteriors. But my fear is that if you if you've already done that and then you're reintroducing the, um, the prosthetic that's already picked up on those posterior two, it won't seat over the head, the top of this abutment. And so there's a choice. The choice is, do you rotate this implant back to where it should have been about five degrees or do you grind the prosthetic? That may be uh, based on how lingual this implant was placed and where it's gonna emerge out of the prosthetic. I believe the doctor picked it up, yep, yeah, and then adjusted. And so the screw access is still in an acceptable position. It's still lingual, it's still in the cingulum of the tooth. It is violating a, uh, an embrasure spot, but on these full large cases, not quite as critical as it is with a, with a crown bridge case. All right, picked up. This implant was probably a little bit of a wrong rotation. I don't, I don't think she had to move the implant. Did she move the implant? No, see we have anywhere there, their chair side. So it was a little bit off on the rotation. Picked it up, healing collars, kind of. Actually, they're kind of a comfort cap for suturing. I suture it and then deliver. So this patient is open, I uh, think six, five, maybe six millimeters. Idealize the plane of occlusion on the lower, perform the chrome on the upper, the plan is to do another chrome on the lower, but we have options now. We have space, we have a plane of occlusion. The restorative, um, the restorative part on the lower can be um, you know, up to the restoring doctor, maybe up to the, the periodontist. So nice results. So that's a chrome with a bite-proof prosthetic. And there's the fun people who did it. Uh, James, those were the three three cases we were going to talk about. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we did four. Do you want to do a QA? and a Yeah, let, 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 let's go. I have a few questions here that have come through. Okay. Um, I know every case is different, um, but let's take, for example, the most common case, a part dentate case. You've got four to five teeth to remove. What is the typical surgery time um, that you see from start to finish for these cases? Well, let's say it's case one, first time you ever did a case. And the one nice thing about, we're, I'll, 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 I'll throw in, this is not a plug, I don't mean like this at all, but the nice thing about working with James is that they come for the first surgery and they don't charge. If you're in the States, it's between $1,600 and $2,000. Oh, it depends on where you live between $1,600 and $2,500 for chair, supply, chair support for that first case. James comes um, to the first one and teaches, teaches and helps and assists and instructs on Chrome. So with James chair side or with his team chair side, I would book out three to four hours. I would probably not book out any less than four hours for your first case. These cases, I think the goal of them, especially if the patient just has a few teeth, maybe not excessive bone reduction, it's a two hour case. Probably not on your first one and maybe not on your second one. But when you have, when you and your team are in surgery with Chrome and it's repeat, repeat, repeat with you know some, some surgical anomalies and things that happen, two hours. We have a private Facebook page here where, where doctors, some, sometimes they boast a little bit about them, but um, you know, one of our KOLs here is um, 60 minutes start to finish, incision to suture, and, and insertion yeah. of, the, of, the, of the prosthetic. So that happens frequently. Yeah, I think in, in our experience so far, um, for the people that have done it first time, it's varied between 
two and a half and four hours. Um, but once proficient, most seem to be coming in around the two to two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, th- and think, think of that, compare that to <clears throat> a denture conversion. Yeah. When we go to a denture conversion, the doctor wants us there before we need to be, really. Uh, sometimes we're there at 7.38 in the morning, but we're not leaving until 1 in the afternoon. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. And yeah. try to do a double arch. You, you're there until 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock at night, and this is two hours, and, and you picked up the second prosthetic that you send to James for a final. A, a, you know, a, a prototype or a final, as opposed to the three and a half to four months of doing conventional, you know, full arch uh, prosthetic fabrication. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Thank you. Um, how long can the bite proof be left in place? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, one of the issues with bite proof is that you can't do long span, um, can, um, long spans. You can't really do cantilevers. It's only on existing teeth. Uh, and you don't want to use it to brace mobile teeth. I mean, this is really an overlay temporary. Um, so I, you know, fortunately it can be remade very easily. It's a digital file. Um, I think if it's really bonded in well and some rules are just kind of followed for thickness and not doing cantilevers and not doing bridges, that kind of thing, it could be in there for months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the main thing is that it's a, it's a temporary measure as part of your overall plan. Yeah, and James, you know, uh, once it's seated, make a matrix of it. Keep, keep a matrix of it in your office, and then you'll uh, a putty matrix. Load it with uh, if 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 this thing breaks, trim away what you need to. Load it with some Luxatemp or other flowable material, and you just remake it again. Very simple. Yeah. Um, one point that I am going to make. Um, which is about the bone reduction. The burrs that we have found the best are, you mentioned Comet yeah. burrs. Yeah, Comet, right? The ceramic burrs. So they do a brilliant um, ceramic burr that is very sharp and it leaves a very smooth finish to the bone. Mm. Yep, we've seen those used a lot. A, a, an aggressive ceramic. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. I mean, that's, um, the, the, the Mr. Hungry Burr is actually a uh, metal burr. You know, it's really made for laboratory use. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question. This is a, a funny one about neodent again, about fully guided. Yeah. The thing with the neodent GM kit is that the, the implant is fully guided. It is controlled by the driver. So the implant is fully guided. The drills don't have a stop on them. Okay. Is that right? Is that right? Um, implant placement, the implant placement in Neodent is fully guided. Hmm. Hmm. But the drill is not. Yeah, the drill, the drill doesn't have a stop on it, but the implant placement is fully guided. I should know that. I didn't know that. So you put an indicator or, or a, you, you put a stop on it. Well, you can, but to my, listen, I use the Neodent guided kit all the time, every pretty much three or three to four, four times a week. Hmm. You're using the spoons. It's a fairly simple procedure to get the depth of your osteotomy correct. That's no problem. But then the implant placement is guided through the guide right. with, with a stop, with your um, indexing already in, in place. So okay. uh, I just want to clear that up. I have another, okay. another question. Yeah, it's just a tip, actually, that the PCOS bone block burrs are for bone reduction. PCOS, have you come across them? Who makes them? What name? PCOS, P-I-K-O-S. Oh, yeah. Mike Picos. He's, um, he is a full art specialist here in the States, um, uh, and he has developed his own line of products, in fact, he has a burr that has an angle on it, an angled burr. And so when you have sharp barbs on the lingual of your bone reduction, this burr, just, you just kind of follow it right around the ridge and it rounds off the, the, the lingual bone or the anterior, you know, the labial bone, either one, so that you have a rounded instead of a right angle when you flap the tissue back over. It's actually a very okay. smart burr. Yep. Picos, uh, P-I-K-O-S, yeah. Another question. 
any other tips for the placement of the pin um, at the time of the fixation base um, placement? Well, tips on seating the pin guide. Um, well, number one is whenever you, whenever you start one of these cases, that you be sure to capture the entire labial vestibule because if there is significant bone reduction, that's where the pin guide is going. And we don't want to have to guess where the tissue or where the fold is. We want to have the pin guide on the model seating on a tissue model, on the teeth on tissue model to simulate what you're going to be doing in the mouth. So if, if, if that is, if that is ideal, then we're, then we're good to go. Sometimes the impressions are short and then you see the pin guide and it's hitting tissue or, and you can't fully seat it. So what do you do? You commit to the surgery and you lay your flap and then the pin guide goes in after the tissue is flapped and then the metal goes in. Uh, but a tip on seating it, I mean, is, you know, in other words, are you, I wonder if he's asking if, if you know that it's seated, if it's accurate, is it up somewhere? Is it not up where somewhere? When you are looking at the window on a pin guide, uh, you'll, you'll see this in our previous uh, meeting on the pin guide, that the pin guide is going to touch somewhere on that tooth. Because of malocclusion and draw, you may find that sometimes it does not sit very well uh, in the window on the cingulum, or maybe on the lingual, uh, on, the, on the lingual of an anterior tooth. Uh, it should fit very well over a buccal cusp right, or even a lingual cusp, but in the anterior, you might see that there's, a, that there's, no, there, there's no path of insertion, so you see a little void. So the thing is to make sure that when you seat it, you can see that it's sitting in the, in the window 100% where the cusp, um, where the incisal edge is. That's how you'll know that it's seated. Yeah, yeah. And, and then if, it, if it's rocking, you can, you can make little adjustments to it. You know, yeah. just like you would indicate a denture. Yeah. And I think also the other one, Alan, is some of these cases are quite broken down. So the patient may attend in between and you might put a temporary on a tooth or something like that. You yep. need to note that because the pin guide will catch on that because that's not what you've made the pin guide to. Yes. And in those situations, if possible, if you still have enough remaining teeth to stabilize the pin guide, you can extract you know, if, it, if you, if in your judgment, if you can res extract that tooth as opposed to grinding out the inside of the pin guide, mm. you can do that. Maybe sometimes it's a loose, you know, it's a loose tooth. And then be sure to read the instructions on that surgery mat. There is a place for notes. And during the meeting, we will type in there, extract tooth so-and-so before placing the pin guide. And that is usually a malocclusion issue or a loose tooth, uh, you know, a mobile tooth issue. Uh, one, this is the last question I have, which is about the carrier guide. So you talked about the importance of seating it to ensure b proper bone removal. Um, the, this person wants to know where are the specific areas it would usually be a problem to seat it? You know, are there common areas? That's a great question. All right, there's a few things. Number one is, if it's not seating down into the chrome lock, look down in there, put some water, put some suction down into that box. Because sometimes bone, tooth, or even plastic from the pin guide or the carrier guide will break off down in there and you can hardly see it because it's clear. So be sure that that box is completely um, free of debris. And then if you find that it's sitting up on the left, sitting up on the right, it's either tissue or bone because we know that it fits into the metal. So it's tissue or bone. And generally in the lower, it's in the lower central anterior um, where doctors are sometimes a little nervous about being an, and justifiably a little nervous about reducing the bone down there because of uh, the nerve, uh, because of the um, nerve bundle, because of an artery. And so sometimes they're a little bit um, you know, cautious and don't reduce enough. And if, that, if there is a reason that you don't want to keep adjusting down, then at least round it off. And if you have to, you can round off the intaglio of that carrier guide a little bit. Now, of course, you don't want to spend too much time grinding on the carrier guide because it is 
a tissue gap, it's designed three millimeters for your flap to come back over and fit under your prosthetic. But you wouldn't want to compromise anything surgically, you know, just to have a worry about a little bit of space on the lingual. So it's kind of a balancing act there if, if that's where the hang up is. But it's going to be bone, tissue, or debris in the box. Yeah, I find it can sometimes catch on the sort of the distal corners of the carrier guide especially if you haven't just relieved the palatal tissue at the very back and also on the midline and the palate on the upper. So sort of around your incisive oh, I, sometimes. Yeah. 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 Ling lingual anterior, the upper or the lower. And yeah, actually I probably meant the upper. Yeah. So just one thing to consider on the carrier, the carrier guide extends back to the metal, the end of the metal. At least that's the way it's supposed to be designed because the metal dictates bone reduction. Mm -hmm. Bone reduction dictates prosthetic space. If, if things are shorter than the metal, if the bone reduction is not to the back of the metal and the carrier guide is hitting the bone, the prosthetic is going to hit the bone. Yeah. Then you lay your flap, prosthetic hits tissue, doesn't seat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Long-term problems, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Alan, that's all the questions that have come in. Brilliant. I think that brings us to the end of our series. Yes. It does. Uh, wonderful, a, a wonderful bank of six webinars. Um, that are have they're brilliant. You know, it's such a main uh, such a, a piece of information to have. So we will be distributing them. They're on our YouTube channel. Um but if anybody, whenever they're looking through them, has any questions, all they have to do is just lift the phone and ask. We have a very busy month coming up. More and more people coming on board with the Chrome journey, which is very exciting. Um, so we're here to help. Um, and I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you and to the team behind it to, for your time and putting this together because it's a, a, an absolutely brilliant resource. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for inspiring us to put it all together.